Can everyone mute themselves, please? We can start, guys. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, assalamu alaikum from the UK. Welcome everyone to MacFest 2024, wherever you're joining us from. Tell us in the chat uh, where you're sitting in the world. My name is Katarzyna, I am a member of the MacFest team. Welcome to the 8th of March, International Women's Day. 8th of March. I don't know if you know that, but 8 is regarded as lucky by many cultures. And when you add the numbers from the current year, 2024, that comes to 8. So we're double lucky today. And we are uh, just about to go into a web webinar that is a highlight of the Muslim Women's Arts Festival with over 12 different events. And we are very, very lucky to have uh, an award-winning Franco-Irish journalist, presenter, writer, and BAFTA-selected filmmaker as a host for our event, Dr. Miriam Francois. She is the director of Finding Allah, an award-winning documentary for BBC and CBC, and the person behind the BBC CBC award-winning documentary, Searching for a Granddaughter He's Never Met. Mariam was nominated as one of only 14 filmmakers to watch in 2021 uh, by One World Media. Always chasing uh, a good story and open to interesting offers with a strong background in successfully breaking exclusive stories, writing regular articles and opinion pieces for award-winning national newspapers and other media in the UK and abroad. Um, she is, uh, she's got a passion for foreign affairs, supported with academic expertise in this area, with a double doctorate in Middle East politics from Oxford University. She was nominated as part of the 40 under 40 European Young Leaders uh, class of 2017 and awarded Women in, Women in Media Award at the Muslim Women Awards 2021. She has a breathtaking bio with a long list of fascinating documentaries and other pieces she created as a reporter, writer, and a presenter. So please share your comments, your thoughts. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A portal or in the chat. And on behalf of MacFest, thank you so much for all the donations. Uh, they help us create all these wonderful events for you. Most of them are free. Subscribe to our newsletter and please follow MacFest and Muslim Women's Arts Festival on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok, and use our hashtag uh, spread honey, not hate. So over to you, Mariam. 
Thank you so much and welcome everyone to tonight's panel, which is all about women, obviously, and inclusivity and what inclusivity means to you. We have a wonderful panel, obviously, to discuss those issues. But before we kick off and I introduce them, I would love to ask the uh, incredible Shaman Bertels to say a few words. Shaman Bertels was... Um, Born in Broughton and was educated at Fairfield High School for Girls. After leaving school, she joined the Royal Bank of Scotland, where she worked until she took early retirement in 1997. She was appointed as a magistrate on the Manchester City bench in 1981, where she sat on the adult family and youth panels and served as a chairman of the licensing bench. After spending three years as deputy bench chairman, she was elected a bench chairman from 2009 to 2012. And in 2013, she transferred to the supplemental unit. In 2008, Sharman was honoured to be appointed as Deputy Lieutenant of Greater Manchester and was hugely privileged to serve as the High Sheriff, High Sheriff to, of the county from 2015 to 2016. So thank you so much, Sharman, for being with us. Over to you. Oh, you're... Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be joining you this evening to celebrate International Women's Day 2024, and I'm grateful to MacFest, an organisation which allows us to open ourselves to the opportunity of meeting all sorts of women, older, younger, and from many different backgrounds and cultures. It's so interesting to meet and learn about other cultures. It doesn't mean you have to forsake your own values, of course not. It just gives you an insight into the larger picture. This year's theme is Inspire Inclusion, and it has never been more important for women to work tirelessly to ensure we stand together, learn from one another, and empower each other. Girls and young women across the globe need strong and motivational role models. I was very lucky to go to a school where I was taught by motivational women who stressed how important it is to have life, life, lessons, if you like, life values. And, and it was always about caring for others, particularly those less strong than oneself. I was also, apart from being fortunate to be taught by inspirational women, I was also very fortunate, fortunate to meet an inspirational woman, um, honorary alderman Nellie Beer, OBE, who had been Lord Mayor of Manchester in the mid 60s. She was totally focused and worked hard to achieve her goals in trying to help others. She introduced me to a wide range of people and she encouraged me to look beyond myself and to help others. I started from humble beginnings, but the life lessons I learned when I was younger have always stood me in good stead. Anything is possible if you have self-belief, real desire and are willing to work hard. We must be confident in our abilities and be brave. Admittedly, there is also an element of luck. I have benefited from meeting, sometimes purely by chance, the most wonderful women who have encouraged and influenced me throughout my life. For me, my greatest fortune was to meet Nellie Beer, who was most definitely an exceptional and inspirational woman. We must learn from one another inspire and empower each other and in doing so we will forge a better more inclusive world for women thank you and welcome to everybody thank you so much for that introduction um and for those inspiring words well on that note let me introduce you all to the incredible panel that we have tonight um we have amina who, Shaw, who is a mother of three an amazing um, TV presenter and the founder of Natural Hair Treats London uh, with all her of her years of experience in hairdressing combined with her own journey of healing and her struggles with hair they all led her to the realization that she wanted to empower women like herself to not only understand their hair and love it but also to develop the level of self-awareness that leads to self-acceptance so we'll speak, be speaking to Amina and we also have the wonderful uh, Sirin Saeed Sirin is a TV host, actor, model and a voice artist. She's also an advocate for working parents as well as neurodiversity and parents with neurodiverse children. Um, thank you to you both for joining. I hope I pronounced everybody's names correctly. Please correct me if I did not. It's Shirin. 
Shirin. <laughs> Thanks, Shirin. Um, <laughs> so Shirin and Amina, I want to kick off by asking about the uh, what this idea of inclusion means to you. For me, um, being an advocate in, you know, um, diversity, equity and inclusion anyway, I think it's a matter of um, being aware, being aware that um, we can't, we are all coming from diverse background and that we all have different responsibilities and needs uh, within our community, in our workplace and in everything that we do. And I think inclusion also spells out the fact that, you know, we need to be mindful when we're doing something, you know, when it comes to the language that we use, when it comes to coming up with the, the ideas that we want to present, that we include everyone around us um, so that, you know, nobody is feeling that they're not part of something. To me, the sense of belonging works hand in hand with the word inclusion. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Hi, everybody, by the way. Sorry. I, <laughs> I forgot yeah. to say hi. <laughs> hi, um, and I'm very honoured to be here, actually, on this panel. Last year, I was a host um, and interviewed somebody, so I was in your position, Miriam. But this year, it's nice to be on the panel as a guest this year. But to answer your question, I think, um, for me, the idea of diversity and inclusion and what that means to me, when I think about those words... Um, I really, I come from the perspective of looking at how people want to be included. I think a lot of the time we can get caught up in assuming and trying to guess what inclusion looks like for other people. But I feel like it's very important to pay attention to the small details and have conversations and really take an interest in other cultures to find out how they want to be included and what diversity and inclusion looks like to the other person. So for example, um, one of the things I do is I organize an event myself, which is called Cis Way or Crown. And last year was the inaugural event, the first one of its kind. So this event I put on basically because I I saw a lack of um, inclusion in terms of culture at Muslim women's events where African and Caribbean cultures were included. And what I wanted to do was put on an event where that representation was at the forefront but everybody else was welcome to come and everybody else was also represented because then in this way, I was able to show how we want to be included, what inclusiveness looks like for mm. us as black Muslim women. Um, and I, really that for me comes from, you know, when a lot of, when you're watching a lot of self love and self worth videos and the perspective of, teaching somebody how to love you is something that's taught you have to teach someone how to how you want to be loved so that they can love you in the same way you have to teach people how to include you what inclusion and diversity looks like for you otherwise people won't know so when i look at inclusion that i look at it from the other the other side mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask you, therefore, because um, it sounds like you may have some criticism of the current ways in which corporations are sort of, there's a lot of talk, right, around DEI and how important DEI is to various companies. But um, without going into too much of my own experience of this space, um, can you tell us about some of your experiences maybe that led you to the conclusion and the work that you do today around this idea that actually it's about companies rather than trying to integrate um, people into their existing structures, making space for within those structures for a different way of being, um, which maybe they hadn't even considered previously? I mean, Amina, you sort of touched on it tang tangentially, I think. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say that I've necessarily had too many experiences of my own, but I think coming from the background as a hairdresser, you know, you sit down and you're the agony on in that position for a lot of people. So I get to, you know, have those conversations with other people a lot of the time. And this is people coming from all kinds of backgrounds. The majority of clients that I had over the years were generally black women or women who come from mixed heritage backgrounds, but I've had 
every I've all I've always done every type of hair. So I've had people from every background sit with me. And I have a lot of friends from other, you know, cultures and walks of life. So generally, I think not just from my own experiences, which I can name a few, but I think from I'm quite intuitive like that. So I, I tend to be an I think I've I'm quite an active listener in that sense. So I feel like just listening to the experiences of other people is why I came to that conclusion. If I go from my own lens, I know that, for example, working in a particular corporation, I didn't see a level of representation that I felt really represented my culture um, that was being shared in that corporation. And I felt like these are conversations that you need to have. Who do I approach in that corporation to be able to have that conversation? And that wasn't something that I felt was an easy thing to do. I also felt like there was pushback. When when you do bring these conversations to the forefront, sometimes they can be very uncomfortable for people. And so in that sense, there's a little bit of pushback. So I feel like sometimes it's easier to maybe set the table yourself, create the table yourself and invite others to it to have a different type of conversation in a way that's not forceful, in a way that doesn't come across aggressive, but in a way that is exchanging an understanding. I hope I'm making sense. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Uh, Shirin, do you have some uh, views on that and your experiences, particularly with regards to the way in which, um, and I, and I want to obviously just touch on the corporate world very briefly before we move on to what I think are some kind of more substantive issues globally, but I am still very interested in the way in which corporates have for the last few years been so keen to talk about DEI and how inclusive they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, my experience as a Muslim woman in those spaces has not been uh, a positive one. Actually, I felt very constrained by what we yeah. are able and allowed to talk about, able and allowed to say, and that those rules are not set by us as in we are not invited to the table in the manner that Amina was suggesting, which is, you know, we want to hear from you and whatever it is that you, that your concerns are but more so, you know, it's felt a lot more like a tick box. So maybe that's just me, sure. And what's your experience been like? Yeah. So let's go back, say, um, five years ago, right? Um, as a Muslim woman, person, a parent, you know, uh, when it comes to, say, for example, Ramadan, um, you know, it, it, it requires a little bit more um, from our normal time when we're doing things, we're a little bit more tired, you know, because we have to get up early morning for our sahur and then having to get through our day with no food, no drinks. And but we, we're still required to have the same kind of energy. Right. And I remember when I said to my colleagues then or my manager that oh, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's Ramadan fasting and I just couldn't keep up with certain things. They're like, well, you know, if you if you do need to take a break, just go for a walk or something like that. Um, and I said, I don't know if that's going to be helpful in any way, because what I had in mind was more around flexible working. You know, perhaps I could start later, finish late, you know, things like that, just to help me get through my day. Because, you know, fasting is great, but it's no mean feat, right? Um, it challenges us and our well-being and, uh, and you know, um, uh, spiritually differently during the month. Um, but what the difference I've seen in the last couple of years with when it comes to, you know, Mary, we're talking about like DEI in the workplace, that I am seeing some kind of change, which I really appreciate where, you know, people, Muslims, like for us, for example, are more comfortable, more comfortable going, coming forward to see that, look, Ramadan's coming. I would appreciate it if I could change my working hours or, you know, working from home a lot more. And I, I guess, you know, in a way, COVID helped <laughs> like you know what I mean like you know with flexible working and things like that um and it's it's just a lot more easier and nicer and and because of that a lot of us are feeling uh, you know that we are included it's, it's more inclusive 
so that's that's one part of it you know that that's from kind of like perhaps the religious side of things the other side is the fact that you know um like i said i'm an advocate for working parents what does that mean so i'm actually a parent to um two neurodiverse children now nine to five doesn't work for me i i literally need to work flexibly right um, what, because I just don't know when I'm going to get a call from school or when I'm going to pull to one site in the morning when I drop my kids off or just after school, you know. Um, so it's more like, you know, when a company says to you, oh, this role is going to be offering a flexible working kind of arrangement. What does that look like for, say, a parent like myself um, who's got kind of like additional responsibilities? My responsibility as a parent is not kind of like, your box standard kind of like parenting responsibility where I can just let my children go. I have to be pretty much hands-on. So, you know, I have to be there when, when, you know, they, they need me kind of thing. Um, so when it, when I, when I say that I do need flexible working, it means that, you know, I expect the, the, the um, organization that I'm working for that uh, whenever um, would accommodate that, you know, instead of saying, right, okay, why don't you put in your, calendar when you're actually going to be out for your school run for example in the morning I can't do that I cannot predict that I literally need that one hour in the morning to drop off my children because things will happen with them you know um, if I get to leave the house drop them off and come back to work within that hour that's a win <laughs> right majority of the time I can tell you it's never the case one of them will forget their PE kit because it's just the way they are um you know or at, like I said before a teacher would say oh mom can I speak to you as I here we go it's not it's never going to be a five minutes conversation it's going to be more beyond that so you know when you see flexible working for parents I think it, it has to be flexible fully flexible and you have to treat parents and, you, you know, your co-workers, your colleagues as adults, because we are adults, you know, we, we are responsible. If I do have to take an extra half an hour on top of my hour, I will make up that hour back because that's how it works. We are adults. We're responsible. Right. And I think when it comes to like an organization, they need to be mindful that when you are actually offering the the um, um, option of working flexibly, mean it. Because working, that's what flexible working looks like. You cannot expect someone to be at their desk by a certain time and finish by a certain time and have literally an hour's lunch because it just doesn't work. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for sharing that experience as well. I wanted to ask you about this idea of like, we hear a lot, this idea of kind of bringing your full self to work. I don't know if you've come across this concept mm -hmm. Um, and I find it very interesting as a Muslim where we live in a very securitized identity, which is to say that um, many aspects of our life are um, filtered through the prism of security. And we as Muslims in this country, but, you know, more globally, actually have to police ourselves in order to be sure that anything we say or do could not be misinterpreted. And so I wonder how you ladies feel about this notion of kind of celebrating Muslim women um, when to me it feels like uh, you know, there's there's a very superficial willingness to celebrate Muslim women. If you try and bring in politicized aspects of our identity, those are not so welcome. And I'm speaking from experience, you know, having been asked to give a Ramadan talk recently and being told, you know, Gaza was off limits. And so I was sort of trying to explain, sorry, well, we're, we're a community that's connected. So, um, you know, when we're fasting and there are people starving, it's impossible for us to think of one without the other. It's inconceivable i understand that's not politically convenient for you but that is the reality and you've asked me to come and speak as a muslim about this so how are you going to tell me i can't talk about this so i'm just wondering about you know i want to i want to push you ladies a little bit more now i think it's a little uh, you know we're talking about corporate structures and the way that they're accommodating but i'm not as convinced as you ladies seem to be that those accommodations are meaningful or reflective of our actual needs beyond sort of you know making sure that we have uh, a little extra time for Ramadan or that we are kind of, that no one's going to make a comment, a negative comment about our hijab. Amina. Mm. That 
was loaded, Miriam. <laughs> and that's was loaded. We live as loaded bodies in a loaded world. If you want to get loaded, I've got plenty more where that came from. <laughs> I think uh, it's a conversation, right? And like I said a minute ago, I think there are a lot of uncomfortable conversations that have to be had if we're going to move past and really find solutions. And we're past the time where it's as simple as blame that one, blame that one. We now have to get to a place where we're just looking at these are the facts. This is everyone's lived experience. How do we change how we are um, operating? How do we change how we're um, you know, communicating with one another? How do we change what this looks like? Because if this is what it still looks like, it's not enough. And I'm talking very loosely. I think everyone understands what I mean. I'm going to say, because for me, as a Muslim woman, I can't escape the reality that I am a black Muslim woman. Okay. So I live that every day. One thing I hear a lot of people like to say is, no, oh, I don't see color. And that annoys me because yes, you do. You do see color. We all see color. We do. It is a thing. So we're going to talk about it and we need to talk about how that impacts everything as well. So for me, my lived experience is I'm black, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman. And those three things together have different implications. And for everyone individually, there's different implications. So you're right. There is a lot of layers to it. And there is a lot that's happening in corporations that's not being spoken about because I think the issue is that the people at in the places of authority don't necessarily want to rock the boat and make the changes because it, you know, they might not be in the positions that they're in anymore, really. Um, but it's layered. There's layers to it. There's, there's, it's not a simple conversation. Um, and this is probably something that if we really get into it, we could be talking about it for hours, Miriam. So I don't know if we, if we really want to go there, but you know, it's a start. We definitely want to go there. I mean, there's no point having this conversation unless we touch on the hard subjects. You know, I think we're not here to kind of softly, softly make people feel good. Let's talk about the reality of the challenges that people are facing, both in the workplace as women, as Muslim women, but also globally as Muslim women, you know. Let, let's actually, I'd, I'd really love to ask both of you about the challenges, the primary challenges that you feel that Muslim, let's list the top three challenges that Muslim women face in this country. And parallel, in parallel to that, the challenges you think Muslim women are facing globally. And then I'd love for you to talk to me about the connection that you feel between those experiences nationally and the global structures that reflect the problems that you identified globally. Sharon, we'll kick off yeah. with you. I think one of the things with me is the fact that you know, um, what I experienced so far is the fact that when I say to people that I'm a Muslim, they're extremely shocked. Mm -hmm. I do not kind of like fit in the box standard, kind of like what a Muslim person should look like. I should be wearing a hijab or I should look a certain way. And, um, you know, I should sound different. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I guess I don't know if that's something that you you you, you both of you face as well. Um but that that's my my challenge um a lot of the time especially here um and it's in a way it gives me the opportunity to educate people and i get quite um almost, it's almost like liberated in a way when i i have the opportunity to tell someone like surprise i'm actually a muslim and guess what you know muslim women can look any different kind of like you know styles faces color and you know we come from all parts of the world that there's so many of us so it's it's quite nice to be able to um let people know that and you know the the kind of like it, it's it's kind of like quite a humbling experience for them because they're like you know all the the they, they weren't they, they're not exposed to someone like me um but at the same time um when i get into kind of like a new environment when it comes to working because i do acting and modeling and you know all the other creative side um 
I do find it's challenging because, you know, when it comes to perhaps um, th the food that's catered for during filming, you know, um, I'm sure you guys have experienced that. Um, there, th there were times when there was hardly anything I could eat because it's either there's alcohol or there's, you know, lard. <laughs> um, but, you know, eventually I've learned to kind of like be braver with the fact that um, I know who I am um, and I'm, I, I feel that I'm more comfortable doing what I'm doing as a Muslim woman. And, and that is when it comes to work. And if it's something that is part of my requirements to work, I will let the, the people that I'm going to be working with know in advance, like, you know, you know, as, uh, you know, as simple as the catering kind of like requirements, for example. Um, and also it's the fact that sometimes, you know, Miriam, going back to what you said about, you know, bringing your full self to work, I love the idea, but again, we know that in reality, that's never an easy thing um, for anyone to do. You know, there are times when, because people are so used to seeing me like this, I've always thought like, oh, you know, perhaps, you know, in the month of Ramadan, you just want to kind of like uplift your spiritual connection a little more. I would love to wear, you know, not necessarily a full hijab, but a scarf to work, right? Um, You know, I I did that uh, a couple of times and I was I was getting looks from like, my co-workers you know and why is that like why was that such a thing where you know that is as if like oh you shouldn't be dressing like that or oh oh you're wearing a scarf now why you know one time I wore I was wearing a, my kind of like traditional outfit for eat to work and someone was making comments because they felt really uncomfortable me wearing like this you know how that like, traditional outfits can look like they're kind of like grand and you know long longer length when it comes to like the skirts and everything and the dresses and you know they were making like comments because they were all they felt awkward for me because I'm not wearing my usual kind of like western nice kind of outfit do you know what I mean I wasn't in my trousers or in my you know cute little dresses I was in this like full outfit to celebrate something and they were coming up comments like oh how, was it comfortable for you to walk in that to work kind of thing and then that made me question like but I thought I'm supposed to be bringing my full self to work. This is my full self. You know, you just can't. So it's, it's yeah, it, it, we, we're still not there yet when it comes to this sort of conversation. But I like the fact that we are talking about it right now and perhaps look at ways on how we can challenge that together. And what about the priorities? What do you think the three main challenges you would identify here in the UK for Muslim women and the three challenges you think we face as Muslim women globally and any connection you see between them? And then obviously I'd love to hear from Amina on that too. I think there's there's a stigma attached to Muslim women. Like I said earlier, you know, you have to sound a certain way, you have to behave a certain way. And people always believe that, oh, if you're a Muslim, that's it, you know, um, you, you're very stuck with, you know, your own traditional ways that there's no way you can fit in with kind of like the Western society. Boy, oh boy, they're so, they're so wrong because there's a lot of us are very well versed with what's required in the Western world. But at the same time, we're so also very attached to our, um, our faith, our belief and, and also, you know, culturally, we are all very different, right? Coming from being Muslim, there's different, there's many different kind of like um, Muslims, if you like, culturally. It depends on where you come from, you know, how you practice the religion is different, how you, you celebrate eats different, how, how your traditional outfit looks is different. So I think it's it's one of those things where we have to be braver in, in being ourselves as Muslims, you know, and, and kind of like educate people a lot more about the fact that um, Islam itself consists of many diverse kind of like cultures, race, um, and people from various different countries. So it's, it's one of those things. And I think we need to kind of like talk about it a lot more. I mean, now over to you. Yeah, I think you're you're right. And I make you right in a lot of what you said, Shirin. And I'm going to start with that, that thing that you mentioned of us showing up as our our best self or our full self or our complete self. And I think it goes back to what you were, you suggested um, in the beginning, Mariam, about policing ourselves. And I think naturally, I say naturally, but it shouldn't be, but I think it is natural for many of us 
to go out into the world and police ourselves, depending on the situation that we're going mm-hmm. in, because we feel like we have to. Otherwise, we might be looked at in this particular way, right? So when you comes to the priorities of what needs to change, that's it. It's how we're looked at. But we can't, we have to change it through conversations like this, through us showing up, through us presenting um, a different story to those who believe whatever story it is that they believe in the first place there's no other way to change the narrative you can't make anyone do anything so you have to just show up as your it forces you to have to show up as your best self it forces you to show up as yourself that is not easy to do though because people are having several different journeys at one time and the reason why i'll go back to my own experience whereas the last couple of years like i said it's been very much about self-development for me. So I've had to unpack so much for my own self in terms of what were the, what were the beliefs that I was holding about myself before I could even start to really understand the impact that the world was having on me and the impact that I was having on the world when I go out there policing myself in certain situations, right? So in terms of what, how we're viewed, we are viewed as women who are oppressed, We are viewed as um, women who don't have the capacity to function in certain situations. We, you know, it is looked at as, oh, that's a surprise. When you hear a a Muslim woman has achieved something in particular, you know, something that is not necessarily a status that you would necessarily hear. Just as a woman, forget then being a Muslim woman on top of it, right? Because then that's that's the extra layer that's added so we've already had this climb you know as women in general where we've had to we've 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 fought to establish a place in society where we are counted and even then we're still it's still rocky ground we're still shaking there it's still a bit you know are we are we really taken seriously you know we still have to fight in a lot of situations right so it's definitely important for us to continue to show up. I was really honored with the privilege of being included in a a, a TED TEDx talk two weeks ago, TEDx event. And the event was amazing because there was 17 speakers in total. I don't think they usually have that many speakers, right? The reason why I mentioned it is because the majority of the speakers 14 of the speakers were Muslim women. Diversity was within those 14 Muslim women. We were not all women who dressed with a hijab. We were not all women who came from the same um, cultural background or racial background. There was so much diversity. But what was beautiful was that the audience members who were non-Muslim, even the team, the tech team, commented and said things like, this is amazing. And we never I never thought that, you know, Muslim women could talk like this, could speak like this. And we're all in the dressing room saying, what do you mean? What do you think's wrong? What do you we're we're normal? <laughs> you know? So It's important because what we're doing is we are changing mindsets to understand that, look, this is not, the rigid ideas that you have are outdated and you need to change them so that we can all fit in here. But it can't be a fight. We have to continue to make these tables, like I said, have these conversations and invite people to them to be involved. Because when you... That's the word, isn't it? Inclusion. When people feel excluded, they will push back. So the more we include people, the more we include everyone into the conversation, you know, inshallah, it will be like the ripple effect, you know, of an ocean. One drop and it just ripples out. That's that's the hope. That's the hope. So I hope I'm hope I'm making sense. I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm doing another TED talk right now. 
No, absolutely. Thank you so much. So I want to ask you, um, ladies, again, about the context that we're facing here in the UK. So just a few days ago, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made a statement outside 10 Downing Street, which is where the very urgent and important talks happen, because, you know, it was a very urgent talk about extremism. Um, and it was very interesting to me that uh, there was, again, talk of Muslim extremism, um, as ever, never get missed out on that one. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about this in the context of um, a huge spike in Islamophobia and particularly gendered Islamophobia. And we know that obviously Islamophobic attacks in the UK tend to overly uh, affect visibly Muslim women, women who are um, visibly identifiable as Muslims. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on um, that statement and its impact on, you know, Islamophobia and women who are experiencing Islamophobia in the UK right now. Do you want me to go Sharin? first? Sharin, go first. Um, I think you should go first, Amina. <laughs> um, yeah, that speech was uh, interesting. I... I I think when I heard it myself, there was a mixture of size and what, huh? You know, there was a, a few different emotions that happened. Um, it's so, it's very complicated, isn't it? Because it's very intrinsic in our society as British people. And when we have, when we have, politicians that are constantly putting up this rhetoric it, it doesn't help because we know that it's already very entrenched in society it's, co it's covert you know you don't see it until you're in a certain situation right you're not met with Islamophobia or racism until you're in a certain situation it just sneaks up on you okay I alhamdulillah have not had a situation where I've necessarily been met with, you know, Islamophobia or racism myself. And I, I, I'm i just I, I'm very happy about that because I know the type of person I am. I don't think it's going to go down well, I'm just saying. But I feel like that's, I mean, that's me as an individual. How other people are left to deal with the situation, you know, an old lady who is just going about her business, an old man coming from the mosque who has just finished prayers. You know, people who generally can't necessarily defend themselves are the ones that end up being the victims in this situation. And the rhetoric that comes from politicians who are held in such high esteem in this country by the majority of the population, it's dangerous and it doesn't help because you are fueling a narrative, which, like I said, is covert. People, you know, will sit and plan, make plans to do things and do it to somebody who is not, not necessarily maybe somebody like myself who will fight back or have something to say, but to the, the old lady who just wants to go and, you know, meet her grandchildren or the, the old man that's coming from the prayers because those are the ones that they can attack. Those are the ones that they can harm very easily because most of the people that carry out these things let's be honest they're cowards they're cowards they hide behind these things they hide behind you know their bravado and all these things they hide behind the keyboards and they're on the keyboards in the comments being the warriors but the rhetoric that comes from the politicians is an integral part of what fuels that Islamophobia. And I honestly don't know how we're supposed to change it because we vote every year for the lesser of two evils or three evils or whatever it seems. And at some point, somebody gets in the chair, but the same rhetoric, just in a different way, comes out at some point. And we see it based on what we're seeing now that's happening in the world. We see it because it's like, are, are we all here just watching the same stuff and we're, we're the ones that are mad? We're the ones that are crazy. But everybody else is. You guys, you guys think there's absolutely nothing wrong with what's happening. Not you guys, obviously, but I'm saying, you know, the politicians think there's absolutely nothing wrong with what they've got all these justifications 
for what's happening, but we're the ones that's crazy. Like a basic level of humanity, where is it? It's like that's completely been, the moral compass has just, it's gone off the scale. And anyway, I'm just going to keep going on. So Shireen, do you want to chime in? Go on, Amina, go for it. It's your platform. <laughs> I think, I think what's happened lately, it's, it's dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. You know, you're creating more divide in an already um, divisive kind of like um, community that we have at the moment. You know, you're just fueling hate. Um, I, I really, I'm obviously nobody is, but I, 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 I'm, I particularly have no time for people who wants to feel hate. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we all come together and understand that um, the whole thing about Islamophobia, you know, it's like you cannot paint the whole community with the same brush just because 1% of the population did something that's seen as completely unacceptable and wrong. You know, you can see with the number of Muslims who would go out there um you know, kind of protesting about something for women's rights, for example, you know, Black Lives Matter. Don't you tell me right now that there was no Muslims who went out there to fight for that. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 all about justice and equality. Right. And I think people must remember that we are all humans, regardless of our backgrounds and our faith. You know, we live in the same world and we all want the same thing. And that, that's why I get really upset and frustrated when, you know, he came up with that speech because I always look, listen to something like that. And I'm like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this when we've all fought so hard to let the world know that we're all united? We're all united because, you know, we are all for humanity. We're all for peace. We're all for love. And we really mean it. This is the thing. Majority of us really mean that. You know, we want to live in a peaceful world, you know, um, we, we want to fight for, for the minority groups because I'm from a minority background. I know what it feels like. I mean, I'm sure you can relate to this, too. You know, being Muslims, we are seen as the minority here. So, you know, we, we know what it's like because we face this all the time. Right. Like I said before, when I say to someone I'm a Muslim, they start to come up with like weird questions. And like, you never asked me this before when I told you know, before I told you that I'm a Muslim. Why has this come up now? Because I make you feel uncomfortable because, you know, um, you have this idea that a Muslim person, like I mean, I was saying, should be oppressed, especially a Muslim woman. I shouldn't be able to be this independent or successful in any way. I shouldn't have any achievements, you know, and I'm sorry for proving you wrong. I've produced my own films. I produce my own work. Everything was off my own back from my background as a Muslim woman, you know, as a minority. And I'm very proud of that. And you should celebrate me for that. And I think, and then when, you know, you get someone like our prime minister coming up with that kind of speech, it makes you feel, I don't want to use defeated because I don't feel defeated. I just feel like it's just so frustrating, you know, it's, you know what I mean? And we like literally have to get off our own, you know, backside, get off our chairs and like fight back. We really have to fight back. And then that's where I'm at with this at the moment. Amazing. Thanks, ladies. I wanted to ask you um, about global solidarity. So I think there's often a tension when we talk about International Women's Day and, you know, feminism in general between the interests of different women globally. And so I wanted to ask you both what your thoughts are with regards to the solidarity that you feel that's expressed um, on a day like today with women from the global south, women who are going through conflicts, you know, obviously I'm thinking right now of Gaza, Sudan, Congo, I mean, we could we could go on. Um, do you feel that International Women's Day has shifted from some of the early criticism we heard of it as being a sort of white feminist celebration to recognizing the interconnectedness of the challenges and standing in solidarity with women who may have less of a voice on a day like today? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It has shifted tremendously. I can see the change from how it was last year to how it is this year and especially today. Uh, if you go on social media, you'll see kind of like an you know, International Women's Day 
is in sol- is standing in solidarity with many different kind of like you said you know um women in 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 kind of like conflict areas or women you know who is facing injustice and and it it gives me hope you know with the world when i see things like this is the fact that you know we're all here, you know, on the same mission here, and that is to save humanity, right? We want, like I said before, we want peace, love, and justice. Um, and and today is such an important day to celebrate women because, you know, it's funny. Um, I have two boys and my husband, so technically I have three boys, right? Um, if my husband's listening, good. I want you to let you hear this. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it's it's funny how I'm always the person who's who's first to get up and do things. You know, we're women, we're the doer, we're the solver, we're the fixer, you know? And I I hate to say that, but it's so true. If I don't get things done, nothing will be done around the house. If I don't initiate something, nothing will happen. And it's almost the same in the workplace or in projects that I've been involved in. You know, you, you, you start to... realize that when you when you are kind of like more involved in in this kind of like ways of thinking and you're like oh okay you know if I didn't do that nothing would have happened right um and and for ex- just simple things like for example um you know when you're you're going on holiday right this whole that holiday wouldn't have happened if we didn't initiate it let's be honest you know planning where you're to go the suitcase is what exactly. happened, right? spending money where to stay you know it's it's simple things like that but it's so true you know um I I don't feel really well in the past I haven't been feeling well in the past few days but again I still got out of the house I show up you know and woman we that's what we do you know we will show up no matter what the circumstances is like you know no matter what situation we're going through if we're needed we're required and we know that you know we need to do it we will be there you know, we, we just have that extra strength that perhaps men don't necessarily have. And I I don't want to apologize to men right now, because to me, that's how I see it. And that's I think that that's the reality of the world. Well, I don't know whether they don't have it or whether just it's the way <laughs> patriarchy and power relations work, that they are entitled enough and power relations are enough in their favor that they can still afford to sit out of the doings around the home um in particular when it comes to domestic uh the domestic sphere which we know remains a deeply unequal part of all of our lives um whether we're muslim women or not um i mean i wanted to bring you in on the the kind of global solidarity question um i'd love to hear your thoughts yeah i i definitely also you know i i um echo Shirin sentiments there because my feed today on Instagram in particular, I saw that I mean we've been we've been seeing this solidarity right, and it is a beautiful thing, and what's even uh, I don't know if it's nicer but what's even even better is that those who aren't reading the room are standing out like th- sore thumbs right now, and it's getting easier to spot those people if that makes sense because there's either two ways of dealing with them either they need to be educated or they need to be just kind of like missed in the situation because you can't help anyone that doesn't want to help themselves right um so I feel like the the solidarity is 100% there and it's definitely um making a huge difference it's making a huge difference even though we are getting the pushback there's always going to be that but it's making a difference and we cannot stop there cannot be any any stoppage right now because the way that it's you know the trajectory is going you know we're, we're getting somewhere it's definitely different it definitely shifted since the last couple of years and I think we are all you know witnessing right now going into a time where things will hopefully be different. There will be some major shifts happening. Um, I think what you were saying um, about the patriarchy, that's always an interesting kind of uh, topic, just simply because I don't know if we're ever not going to have this patriarchy, right? And I think us as women, we we do a good job of not making them feel too bad about it 
because actually no we do because <laughs> we you, could you, yeah you do, you might I definitely make every male in my life very aware of the extent to which they're active participants in a structure of unequal power but yes and and play, most play, women are very accommodating I agree fair play to you I think most women are very accom com accommodating and maybe a bit too accommodating and in order to um you know make a shift there does need to be again those conversations had within the within your homes within your circles it's about educating yourself and it's about finding out how to educate really and truly it's it's how do you communicate with people on a level where they're actually going to take it in? Because you can't, there's no point in, in, in having a conversation. My thing is there's no point in having conversations that's going to lead to you just shut down in the end, because it, then we're not getting anywhere. So the thing about us as women is we are able to be strategic. We are able to see, you know, this is how the queen on the board moves, right? On the chess game. Um, we have to move like that she's she's got so many moves that she can make you have to know which one is the right one to make at the right time and so as women I think we are we have the ability to be strategic in how we go about educating the masses we are literally the shepherds to us to to the sheep just like what Shirin was saying we are the shepherds to our sheep and we have the ability to change the narrative from within from within our household first, from within our family networks first, from within our circles of friends. Mm -hmm. And that's where it starts. Because again, it's like the ripple effect. You know, we all have our individual circles. If we're all, you know, doing it from where we stand, then we're going to eventually get somewhere. It might take a while, but we'll eventually get there. I just want to say something. So I just it just reminded me of a very, very um at that time it was a very frustrating experience. But every time I think about it, I laugh. So um my aunt came over from Asia, right, to stay with us for a while. And it was, I think it was her first day. Um, so I was home with her, and then my husband just came back from work. And then she says to me, Oh, go and get him a glass of water or something. And I was like, Why? What happened? Oh no, he just came back from work. I was like, Anne, well, he's tired. You know, you need to get him some water. I don't know. I don't know. Prepare some food or something. And I was like, no, we don't. What for? And then, you know what I mean? It was like this kind of like frustrating conversation with my, you know, bless her, you know, my aunt, my aging aunt, you know, it's just because it's part of our culture, right? Like Asians or, you know, in some other cultures too. But it's just like, there's no need, you know, because we, we can't be that accommodating because, we're doing so much more. We're doing so much more that it's, it's it's impossible or ridiculous to add all these little things that a grown man can do themselves. Do you know? There's no need for it. But yeah, I, I just thought I wanted to share that because we touch a bit on it. So yeah, he's a big boy. I'm sure he can find the kitchen. Um, <laughs> you can imagine what a joy it is to live with me. Um, I wanted to wrap up by asking, because obviously we're talking about Muslim women today in particular, what it is about your faith that gives you the strength, the power to um, aspire to inspire, right? We're here to talk about inclusion. And of course, you ladies are, uh, you know, the success stories that we want to model our lives on, that you want to have to take examples from your journeys. So what is it that you find within your faith specifically that you feel drives you and empowers you as a Muslim woman to achieve your own goals? I think being a Muslim, I'm obviously first and foremost, I'm very, very grateful. Um, you know, I've learned to be, especially um, as I grow older, I'm, I'm becoming more grateful, you know, less kind of like materialistic and more spiritual and appreciating, you know, what God's given me and my family and people I'm surrounded with. Um, and I think there's a lack of that um, for many people because they're always aiming higher, aiming for something that's sometimes beyond reach. Um, but having this faith, I, I now learn that it's okay. It's okay if I don't meet that goal I have in life 20 years ago because this is what's written for me you know this is where I'm supposed to be uh I'm not I may not be um a, a famous celebrity which I really really don't want to be I just want to be a person who can actually 
um, be there to support change and, you know, change for the better. You know, um, I've come to realize in the last few years that I'm actually a connector um, for a while. I struggled with that. Like, you know, when um, I'm always really good at connecting people and then um but I get nothing in return. Not that I was expecting it, but you know, when you're helping someone out and then you kind of like know, oh, okay, perhaps you know, in the future, if you need something, then, you know, that person's going to be there to support you. But it's it has never happened for me. Every time I knock on doors asking for f- favors to, you know, for a little bit of support, I'll, I get nothing. But at the same time, people will always come to me and say, hey, Shireen, can you help me with that? Hey, Shireen, do you know someone who does this? You know, and I'm always doing that. I'm the connector. And I believe that's my purpose here. And that's great because I I love the fact that being uh, a Muslim, I understand, I believe in God so much that I believe in my, my in, in having a purpose in life. It grounds me. It really, really grounds me. I think for me, if I'm, I have to pick something out of my faith, it is du'a. And my relationship with Dua has definitely increased over the last couple of years. And actually, literally about two weeks ago, I bought the book by um, Ali Umrayan, which is called The Power of Dua. And listening to that book, she has a lot of um, experiences other people's experiences, but she's included in the book on their um, their experiences with du'a, making du'a to Allah, and having that that faith and that consistency, that conviction that Allah is going to answer their prayers, and it's been an inspiration for me this last couple of weeks to improve my relationship with. Dua even more and making that a very central part of my connection to Allah. Um, But over the years, I know that has always been central in a lot of ways anyway, just by looking back on my own experiences and where I can say, you know, wow, as a Muslim, I know that In this situation, my dua was answered. In that situation, my dua was answered. Even if it was a no, it was answered. And Allah brought something better for me. So for me, that has definitely impacted in in every facet of my life as a mother, especially in my work as well. Like this last few years, wanting to develop the, the programs that I developed has come from a place of, I want to help. So I don't want, you know, being an entrepreneur is not an easy thing to do. Um, People maybe make it out like it's, you you get to a level when you're, you've got six figures, seven figures, and and then you're there, you know, and it's, it's, it's not as easy as that. And it's not as simple as that. And actually for me, knowing my why and knowing how, you know, was very integral for me of what I wanted to achieve, of understanding what I really wanted to achieve, what was my purpose. As you said, Shirin, um, understanding what my real purpose was um, in terms of, you know, the gifts and talents and the skills that Allah has given me and that I've been able to develop over the years. How do I utilise that? How do I really utilise that to make a difference? So Dua was really in, integral with that, speaking to Allah about it, you know, taking the what I saw as intuitive guidance, you know, and making the move or not making the move or being patient and knowing when to be patient but having that connection and the more I make dua the more that grows the more that grows and the more I see it in my life in every facet of my life especially with my relationships as well you know talking to my kids talking to family members talking to every every everyone that I am connected to um I make dua for these people you know these people are included in my du'as. People that I don't know, you know, are included in my du'as. And I say that because we make du'a for 
our brothers and sisters who are abroad, who are suffering, who are going on. People who I don't know are included in my du'as. And I, as far as I am concerned, I see the reflection of that in how I move through the world because of my insistence on improving that connection. Wow, thank you so much. I think, you know, to end on the kind of the power of dua in our lives um, as Muslims and the way that it sort of inspires us to um, kind of connect to the source in all that we do um, is a wonderful way to wrap up this session. So I want to thank you both for your time. I want to thank everyone uh, who participated in the session as well. I want to thank obviously the organizers for having us and yeah, happy International Women's Day. Keep fighting the good fight. The work is not done. Still plenty more battles to fight. We may be making progress, but I would suggest there's still a long way to go. So keep fighting ladies. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been an, an honour to be on in this conversation. It's really been interesting. Didn't quite go how I was expecting it to go, but that's always good. That's always what do good. you mean? It's, it's gone well. <laughs> it's brilliant. I loved it. I thought it was You've been positive. <laughs> thank I'm you so, so much, ladies. Uh, thank you, Mariam, for fantastic hosting. Um, it's been a fascinating event. Um it was a pleasure for me to just listen, stay in the background and uh, really go over and uh, find the links also in my life, although I'm not a Muslim. So very brave of you and big respect for telling the truth, telling your truth and living your truth. Okay. And uh, so thank you so much also to Hajra in the background. Thank you to Kezra for organizing this. And thank you so much to Sharman uh, for being part of this panel. Now we've got the next event tomorrow. Uh, do join us. Um, it's another high um, level event. It's, we've got um, fantastic speakers. Um, it is an in-conversation event with the well-known multi-award winning journalist, author, radio and TV broadcaster, commentator, Professor Yasmin Alibai Brown. Um, I have shared the link in the chat. If you haven't seen it, please go to MacFest website and to Eventbrite um, to um, sign up for tomorrow's event. Thank you again and see you tomorrow. Bye.